We're here again today with Brian Allison, and we're, we're going to be talking about ink, but before we talk about that, where are we at right now? Well, we're at Historic Manster Station in Goodlettsville, Tennessee, in the Bowen Campbell House. An amazing site here in the middle of Tennessee. If you're ever in this area, check it out. Uh, but we're talking about ink today. Inks from the 18th to 19th century. We got a few examples here. Tell us about ink. Well, ink is um, a pretty complicated subject, and it's one that if you're going to be writing with quill pens, it's the, it's as important as the pen. Mm -hmm. Not all inks are made the same. Not all pens are made the same. You've got to find the right um, combination, um, combination right? of the two. Uh, now we've got several. Uh, varieties that you can go with. Uh, modern calligraphy ink, there's absolutely no reason not to. It's mm -hmm. sold in the stores, yep. it's uh, art stores, mm -hmm. uh, you sell it as well, right. and there's, it's packaged India ink, but it's calligraphy ink, and it's good for use with quill pens. Um, what you want to avoid is anything that's like an acrylic ink, or those artist inks, those tend to clog your quill pen. That's so. because they, they dry up and they kind of paint the yes. pen, right? In fact, they uh, they would use acrylic ink, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, India ink back uh -huh. in the old days, uh, and they'd use it with quill pens, but you better uh -huh. be prepared to cut a new nib every time because they knew it was going to dry and harden. So and that had it. shellac in it? Had shellac as a binder. So that's going to be rough on the quill pen. Uh, it was a long time before they came up with uh, a proper ink for uh, writing. In the Middle Ages, the most popular ink was uh, carbon ink, or uh, right. uh, made with lamp black. Right. So there are powdered ink, that's a lamp black ink. Mm -hmm. It just had lamp black and a binder, gum arabic. Pretty much, right. and that's it. And uh, you can make that with distilled water. You want mm -hmm. distilled because that cuts down on the mold growth and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, that is good to go. That's been used from the Middle Ages as an artist ink, as a writing ink, all the way up to the present day. Uh, and that's very good for people who are on the go, who are uh, like uh, traveling in the wilderness, something mm -hmm. like that, don't have a lot of supplies, just bring along a few packets of uh, ink. You can but mix up, yeah. But it's got problems too. Well, it does, because you know, basically it's, uh, uh, you've got to dump out what you can't use at the end of the day. And the other problem is, if it rains, you can kiss your writing goodbye, because yeah. it's not waterproof. Right. So it took them a long time to come up with the ideal waterproof ink, or what they consider the ideal waterproof ink. And uh, they finally hit on the magic solution, which was, uh, it involved these little things right here. So they so. look like, I don't know, a misshapen acorn or a dried up cherry? I they're, don't know They're why. not pretty little things, <laughs> no. are they? But these are very valuable and were used at the time uh, uh, for making ink. They're called oak galls, or oak apples, some people call them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're made by the gall wasp. The gall wasp berries, burrows into the tree to breed, and this is how the oak tree uh, uh, responds, responds it. defends itself. You may have some of these in your oak trees around your house, because they're in the United States or in Europe, mm -hmm. they're everywhere. Uh, these are imported from Syria, and even at the time, the best of the, um, the oak galls that were available were called uh, Aleppo galls, because they came from that little town in Syria. Uh, but this is almost pure tannic acid when it comes off the tree. And so they uh, figured out a little bit of science experiment uh, you take this and a couple of other ingredients, and you can come up with an amazing uh, well, waterproof ink that'll last for a long, long time. So the pigment inks will sit on top of the surface, but that means when water gets underneath it, it'll, it can wash the writing right off the page. Sure. Whereas this actually etches the paper. Uh, it causes, in fact, um, one of the big headaches for conservators these days. Iron gall ink was the universal ink pretty much from, uh, say, about the 15th century all the way up to the, the end of the 19th. And uh, well, we'll go back 12th century, probably mm. all the way up to the 19th. And um, these, uh, it, it's great. It uh, you can't wash it off the page because it's actually burning into the fibers of the paper. And so today, after three or four hundred years, some of that writing has actually burned through the paper. Now you can hold it up and read exactly. it. Exactly, right and, so, the and you actually see burns in the shape of the writing, wow. which means uh, it eventually destroyed the paper. Now that wasn't a problem for them because yeah. they didn't think the writing would last that long anyway. Today, it's a real headache to try to kill the acidity before it actually destroys the document. So a lot of your favorite documents, like the Declaration of Independence or George Washington's papers, cure, uh, conservators have to go to great lengths to try to neutralize that acidity before it destroys that document forever. So we've got the oxgall, <coughs> right. which is tannic acid. What's the other component? Now the next one is what they called green vitriol or copperas, and that's this little green crystal powder. Um, that you can get today, it's actually sold as a, a fertilizer uh, okay. for it garden shops. You can get it from pigment stores online. Uh -huh. They made their own. So, uh, but this is iron? It's iron sulfate. Iron sulfate. Iron 2 sulfate. They have a new code where you, you put the number on it. So you want iron 2 sulfate. Mm -hmm. um, so they call it copperas 
but only probably because it was kind of a green color. Yeah. There are there's copper sulfate. It's very blue green, yes. but it's not the same thing. No, copperous. By the way, it, we're not talking a time of scientific uh, right. rigidity. So uh, copperous can mean either iron sulfate or copper sulfate. Okay. But they called it that because it was greenish blue and it had mm -hmm. that tint to it. So, but you want iron to sulfate for this mm -hmm. because this is actually called uh, ferrogallic ink sometimes or iron gall ink, ah. and that's the combination of these two uh, substances. It's pure um, simple science. Crushed tannic acid mixed with iron two sulfate, and you end up with this blue black ink almost instantly. And th they would grind <coughs> grind this into a powder in yes. a mortar and pestle. Uh, they would grind that into a powder. Uh, what you've got some versions here? I do have those right here. When you see them, there's very little difference between the two. You've got um, on this side is the iron two sulfate. That's the crystals right here. This is the blue green crystals here. And on the other side, this is the oak galls crushed up and moved into solution here. Now we're going to try this. I don't know what's going to happen next, but let's live dangerously, John. Okay. And there you go. That that is an amazing process to watch. It's fun. Um, they're just so this isn't everything of this ink. It still needs right. You could use this as ink, but it's not going to work very well until you add gum arabic. The mm -hmm. third ingredient is always a binder. Gum arabic is a naturally uh, occurring substance. Kind of sticky. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you can get it out of. Uh, it, it's actually food safe. It's used mm -hmm. in chewing gum and things like that. Sure. But what it is is it's sticky and it'll make that ink bind and thicker. And that's one of the keys to any of these inks that you can do. If you need to thin them, add a little bit of distilled water. If you need to thicken them, add a little bit of gum arabic, and these will, these two substances will keep you uh, keep your ink to the right consistency, which is very important when you're using a quill pen. So you mentioned gum arabic as a binder. Uh, honey. Honey is actually period accurate. That goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, that was used with um, uh, with. Uh, 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 carbon ink before they invented iron gall ink. So that's mm -hmm. been used as a binder for years. Egg white has been used. There's uh, other yes. substances. Right. I would recommend you experiment with some of the more uh, yeah, arcane funny. ones because it takes some you know, some getting used to you right. and the proportions right. But uh, basically gum arabic is easily available in art stores right. and uh, makes a suitable one. honey or uh, other things are going to go bad. Yes. Yeah, and that's one thing nasty. also to keep in mind. If you use water in this, it will go bad eventually. It'll go moldy. A uh, little ascorbic acid, vitamin C, will keep that from happening. Or alcohol. My uh, iron gall ink that I make at home, I use red wine, and I've had very little mold growth over the years. But if you use just water like they did, it eventually it will go moldy. So this isn't the only uh, type of ink? There are other colors that were no, available? No, black was the most formal and that was mm -hmm. the most used, but there's other colors available as well. Blue is especially popular, not usually for correspondence, but for marking things, for uh, uh, for art and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And that's usually a concoction dyed with indigo uh, in those days. Uh, then they also had red ink, and red ink was usually made with uh, logwood in those days, which is a little hard to come by today. These days, yeah. yeah but. Um, it's, uh, uh, it was a very important thing. Every, almost everybody had an office would have red ink around because it was used for business forms. It was used to mark and underline important se sections of legal documents, that sort of thing. In fact, uh, there's a term that we have that goes all the way back to the Middle Ages when the Catholic Church, the monks, used to record the calendar for the year and they would put the important feast days in red ink which gives us the modern term, a red letter day. And that all comes from the use of that red ink. So that was incredibly important uh, uh, for business and legal military sort of things as well. Mm -hmm. And now one other thing about iron gall ink, if you're going to try that and do that experiment at home, or you know, do safety precautions. You don't want to you know, wash your hands before you eat. And most of this That's, isn't. Yeah, strong yeah, acid. Yeah, there, it yeah. is a strong acid and you don't want to get it on your skin and everything. It turns mm -hmm. my fingers purple every time I do it. Um, uh, and you obviously, it's, there's a little bit of toxicity, so you want to make sure you're, you be safe. Right. Uh, the other thing to be important on, uh, to remember on this is this stuff is acidic, which means if you're going to use it, you want to uh, contain it in a non-reactive container, which means glass or ceramic, that sort of thing it will pit and corrode most metals, which means don't use it in a pewter or a brass inkwell or without a ceramic liner. And if you're going to use metal pen nibs with it, I wouldn't recommend it, especially with a vintage nib, it will destroy it eventually. Uh, but if you use even modern nibs, the best way to cut down on it is dip it in water every time you use it. After you're done, dip mm. it in water, wipe it off clearly because this stuff will eventually corrode and destroy your pen nib. There's nothing you can do about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Fascinating topic. Lots to learn here. Chemistry and all this just kind of history all built into something as simple as ink. Uh, so really, really fun. Uh, if you want more information, especially like uh, how to 
to make a quill pen. Make sure to check out this episode and stay tuned. We'll be covering more of these similar topics, paper, uh, other things like writing. Make sure to stay tuned. Thanks for watching.